This video covers the common task of creating variables. So um, oftentimes we want to create a new variable that is a function of our uh, other variables in our data set. And so within this tidyverse and the dplyr package, there are two functions that are really, really useful for us. One is the mutate function, which will add a newly created column to the tibble or data frame that you're already working with. And then transmute, which will create a new variable in a separate tibble. So um, the syntax is very similar to all the other tidyverse function syntax. Uh, we do the function name, the tibble or data frame we want to work on. And then to create our new variables, we give the new variable name equal to whatever function of the data that we want to do. And we can create more than, variable, more than one variable at once, of course. So we just separate the new variables by commas. So um, again, uh, we're going to put off reading in data for a little bit. So let's just pull in some data from an R package. So you'll need to install the 538 package if you have not done so already, but then either run library or require on 538. This gives us access to all the different data sets that uh, the 538 website has used to um, create their articles. And so one of the data sets within there is a data set called Fandango. And so this has um, different user and critic reviews from differing websites from films from 2014 and 2015. And so just looking at Fandango, since this is uh, one of the newer packages, the people that have written this um, wrote it in sort of the tidyverse framework. So uh, the Fandango uh, data set from there is already a tibble. And so it has this really nice printing property. So we see that there are um, all of these different columns and there are 146 observations. And so you can just get an idea of what's going on here. There's a year column. There's two years in here, 2014 and 2015. There's Rotten Tomatoes score, then there are Rotten Tomatoes critic score, uh, Metacritic, Metacritic user. So there's a bunch of different um, types of rating systems out there, different websites that do ratings, and this just has information about these films. So um, we might want to create a new variable that's a function of some of these. So for instance, um, we have a Rotten Tomatoes score and our Rotten Tomatoes user score. We might want to find the average of those two and make that a new column. So what I could do is use the mutate function, and this will um, go ahead and add that new column to our data frame. So again, this piping or chaining is read as then. So this is saying, take the Fandango data set and then mutate or create a new column that, that you're gonna append to this, a new variable called average rotten. That is a function of the rotten tomatoes column and the rotten tomatoes user column. And this is the function. We're just gonna add the two together and divide by two. But one thing to note here is that we have not overwritten the Fandango object. So this means that um, even though we've run this code, it's done the evaluation, it's created a new variable, even though we can't see it because it's sort of off the screen here, um, this has not been saved anywhere. So essentially we've lost whatever computation has been done because we've not saved this as a new R, new R object or overwritten our Fandango object. But um, you know, if we wanted to make sure that we could see it here, just to show you that it is there, I did Fandango, then mutate that new variable, and then select that column. It does exist. Here it is, average rotten. The first value is 80, so 74 and 86 divided by 2. Yep, that's 80, so um, that's good. It's doing what we think it should be doing. Now, this process of um, creating the variable and then essentially selecting it, that's exactly what transmute sort of does. So transmute just um, returns a tibble with the new variable or variables that you've created. So it doesn't append it to the previous one. But again, if you wanted to save this, what you need to do is save the result of this as an R object. So we might go into R Studio here, uh, library 538. And we can do Fandango. And then, whoops. Then let's uh, mutate our new variable, average rotten. I'm going to call it a lowercase a, sorry. Average rotten, which is going to be a function of our. Rotten Tomatoes score. Rotten Tomatoes user. So again, this is not being saved anywhere, but it's out there. So I might need to save this as a Fandango 2. Oops, sorry about that. Now I would have this. You notice that it popped up here in my R environment. Uh, now I do have a data set that has that extra column. And note that one nice thing about our studio is it does give you a way to view your entire data set. Um, you can either run, run this command, view of your 
um, data set, or you can just click on it up here in your global environment area. Notice that this is a capital V, by the way. Um, it's hard to notice that there. OK, so um, again, mutate will just add it to the tibble or data frame that you're already working with. Transmute, on the other hand, just creates a new variable in a new tibble, or if you have more than one variable, more than one. So um, that's an easy way to create some new variables that are functions of what you have in your data set already. Another really common thing that you want to do is just some basic um, numeric summarizations. And so there are two functions from dplyr that will help you do just really simple basic things. They are the group by function and the summarize function. So let's first utilize the summarize function to um, summarize some of our columns in our data set. So um, we might want to find the average number of Fandango stars and, say, the standard deviation of the Fandango stars for all of the movies in our data set. So I can take the Fandango data set and then summarize a new variable called average stars. And here I give it the function mean of our Fandango stars column. SD stars is going to be the standard deviation of our Fandango stars column. And you can notice that that spits out a tibble with two things, our two new variables that we see there. So um, this is not the only way, of course, to find the mean of that column or the standard deviation, but it's a way that stays in the tidyverse framework um, and is kind of nice to use because you know what you're going to re get returned. It's a tip. Now, of course, um, you know, we had different years in the data set, for instance, so I might want to get these summarizations across the different years. And so one thing you can do is use this group by function. So group by essentially puts a little label on your um, on your data set, on your tibble, that then anytime you would run a summarize function, it would know to do the summaries by each one of those groups. So for instance, if I do Fandango, and I just hit return on that, you can see that it's just a tibble 146 by 23. If I do Fandango and then um, do the group by command and group it by year, now whenever I print it out, notice that it says it has groups associated with it. So this is really just adding an attribute to that data set. Again, I've not overwritten it, so really it's not there. But if I then continue to chain and I run a summarize command, it's now going to know to summarize by the year variable. And you can group by more than one variable if you want, of course. So I'm doing Fandango. I'm adding this grouping attribute to it. And then I'm saying summarize. And then the summarize function knows, well, for every group, I want to find the average stars and the standard deviation stars by via these functions here. And so now, for each one of our group values, we end up getting the average and standard deviation of the stars. So really quick, easy ways to do summarizations. OK, so uh, you know those are the easy summarizations. What if we want to do more complex ones? Well, to do more complex ones, we probably need to start thinking about some of that if-then logic that you um, have probably been exposed to in your prerequisite course. So if-then logic in um, R functions just like other languages. We just got to learn the syntax of it. So the syntax for a one basic if statement is just the if keyword followed by a condition that's going to resolve as either true or false, curly brackets, and then the code that you want to execute if the condition is true. To do an if then else, you can do if condition. And then the way to do an else would just be where that line with that second curly bracket is, you just put an else there. If you want to do a bunch of else ifs, you can see the notation here. We just continue in that same manner. Now, um, just good programming practice. It's always good to put in sort of a uh, if no conditions are met case that you can at least throw a flag if, uh, if one of your conditions wasn't met. Um, it's just um, a good practice to do that. OK, so um, suppose that we want to create a new variable using some if logic. So let's think about that iris data set. If you remember that iris data set, it's got a bunch of flowers. Sorry, Iris, it's not pretty right now. So it's uh, information on flowers, 150 observations with five columns. So I might want to create a new variable that's just for large Satosa flowers. And so you might think about using this if-then logic and say something like, well, if the petal length is greater than 1.5 and the petal width is greater than 0.3, and the species is Satosa, then what I want to return is large Satosa. And so this is the right logic, but not the right way to do it in R. Um, this if statement can only take in a single um, comparison here. So you notice that if you ran this code, you would get a warning, and it would say the condition has length greater than 1. 
And that's because this compound logical up here is actually doing 150 comparisons and returning a vector of 150 true false values. The if statement itself can only look at one true or false statement. And so what it says here is I'm only going to look at the first element. So that's exa not exactly what we want to have happen, right? So how do we do this? How do we create a new variable with that same logic? Well, there's this if else function that is vectorized, okay? And so a vectorized function just means it acts on an entire vector. So let's go to the help for that. So here's what if else does. It returns a value with the same shape as whatever you're giving it for your test. So whether it's a matrix of true falses, a vector of true falses, it's gonna give you an output object that's the same type, the same shape. Um, and it's gonna be filled with elements of, of yes or no. So this is the code that you execute if you have a true. This is the code you execute if you have a false. So that's exactly what we want it to do, right? We want to give it that compound logical, which will be a vector of things. And if it's true, we want large Satosa. If it's false, we don't want large Satosa. So we'll have to give it a different value. So uh, again, this is how we would do that. We would say if else, give it that compound logical that ends up being 150 true false values. And anywhere there's a true, we're going to return ls. Anywhere there was a false, not ls. And you can see that there are only a couple cases where we had um, trues. And so this is one way that you might create a new variable. Now you can put this logic into the dplyr framework. So you can utilize this with either transmute or mutate. So here I'm going to mutate the iris data frame a new variable called size. So mutate's going to add it to my iris data frame. And then I'm going to put the if else code in here. And one nice thing about utilizing this within the mutate function is I don't have to put iris dollar sign before each one of these. So it saves me a little bit of typing. But you can see here, we now get a new column to our data set that has the appropriate values. Right. Now again, we did not overwrite the iris data set. So this is really lost forever unless we saved it. Somewhere. All right, so now we have a pretty good idea about um, creating new variables for, that are functions of our previous variables. Um, we can do some basic summarizations. Other things that we commonly want to do with our data sets are manipulate the shape of them. So the tidyr package allows us to do that. And really it allows for two really important actions. One is to make a wide data set longer. So let me just show you what a wide data set looks like. So this data set down here would be called wide. It's a wide data set because there are multiple observations within a single row. So for instance, here's Atlanta. It has a temperature observation for, 80, for Sunday, for Monday and Tuesday, et cetera, all in the same row. So this is wide data. Generally speaking, the algorithms that we run, the machine learning, the regression, whatever we're gonna be doing to actually analyze our data, they are usually gonna require our, require our data to be in long format. So long format would be something like this where every row represents one observation. So, oh, um, you know, a lot of times data um, comes like this, say in Excel, because it's easier to look at and see. But what we need to do to actually run our analyses would be switch it to, say, this long form that you see down here. So the gather and spread functions allow us to go back and forth between long and wide data. We'll also look at separate and unite for splitting columns or combining two columns together. So um, we're going to read in a data set from the internet. Um, again, we'll cover reading in data in just a little bit. But um, within the tidyverse, there's a package called readr. So if you've done library tidyverse, you get access to all the readr functions. And one of those functions is read underscore dlim. And this will read a delimited file. So now I'm just passing it the file name, which is just a file that I have hosted on the internet. It's a text file. And since I'm using read underscore dlim, it needs to know what the delimiter in that file is. And it happens to be a space. So that's the code that's going to read in that from the internet and store it in the object temps data. OK, so again, we'll cover that later. But this is what that data set would look like. It is now in wide format. So what we want to do is create a single, obs or a single row for every one of our observations. So we want to have a row for Atlanta on Sunday that's 81, Atlanta Monday that's 87, Atlanta Tuesday that's 83, and so on. So we can do so using the gather function. So gather requires three things. It requires the columns that you want to turn from wide format to long format. So here we're saying columns two through eight. 
one, two, through eight. So we're going to take those eight columns or those seven columns. And what we want to do is um, specify uh, the two columns that they're going to be split into. So uh, we need to give it a key value pair. So the key is the new name for the values in the columns. So here are the values in the columns, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So a reasonable name for that would be day of the week, right, or day. So we'll specify the key. That's going to be the new variable name for our day of, for our columns. And then we need to specify a value, and that's going to be the new name for the observations within here. So these all represent temperatures. I'm going to call that temperatures. And that'll be the name of this column. So again, three things that we've got to provide. The new name that represents the columns. So our columns here are Sunday through Saturday. So the name for that will be day. The new value, the new column name for the actual values within our data table. So here, temperature. And then we need to specify which columns we're going to take from wide format to long format. So two through eight. We run that, and we get a long format data set. Now, this would be um, ready to go into some sort of um, algorithm, maybe a regression model or something like that. We can go backwards. So um, the gather function works in the exact opposite manner. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, sorry. I got ahead of myself. So uh, we can provide the column names, the columns that we want to use and gather in multiple ways. So before, we would just put two through eight. We can also use any of those sort of select function no notation that we did before. So here we're saying all the columns between Sunday and Saturday. So between Sunday and Saturday. Okay, um, so now let's talk about going in the opposite way. Um, you don't generally want to do this, but every once in a while you might. All you need to do is specify um, the key and value, but sort of in the opposite direction. So the key is the new column name, and the value is the value to spread out. So going from this data set, we have day and temperature. So day is our key, and temperature is the value that we want to spread out. And it did change the ordering of our of our columns, but other than that, we get the exact same data set from before. OK, um, so now let's just do a quick example of, say, splitting a column into multiple columns. So here I'm going to read in um, the Chicago data set. And this is a CSV file or comma separated value file. And again, this is a function from the read R package. So I'm just going to grab that from the internet, pull it right in. And it's a tibble with 1,400 rows and 11 columns. And so you might look at something like um, this date column here. And so uh, the date column is a character column. That's not exactly right. It should probably be a date formatted variable. We'll talk about those later in the semester. Um, but you might think, well, we have month, day, year. Maybe we want to split these up into three separate columns, one representing the, the month, one representing the day, and one representing the year. So there are functions to do that for us. So the separate function will split up um, one column by some delimiter. So I take that date column, so I'm saying Chicago data, then separate on the date column. I want to name the three new columns that I'm going to create, so day, month, and year. And I want to separate those based off of where a slash occurs. So this first one will be the day, month, and year. So I've done that incorrectly, probably, because this is probably in month, day, year format. But I think you get the point there. So we're splitting on that slash, so day, month, year. There are some options that you can put on separate. Um, so one is convert equal true. So you might notice that that original date variable was character. And so when we um, split it up, we ended up getting characters for all these, even though you know, those are really numeric values in some sense. Although for month, you might not argue that. Um, so if you do convert equal true, it's going to try to convert those to numeric if it's easily doable. So these have been now converted to integers. And then there's the option remove equal false. So remove equal false says keep that original variable in there. By default, it's remove true. So you can see that that date is gone from here. There's also a unite function that would um, take, say, the three columns we have here and put them into one column if you wanted to. All right, so hopefully you're starting to see all the wonderful, cool things that we can do in R with just a couple lines of code. Um, we're utilizing this tidyverse because these functions all have the same kind of syntax. Um, they work really quickly. And they all work together. So we got dplyr, which is great for doing subsetting of rows, selecting of columns, creation of new variables. We have tidyr, which is great for um, changing the shape of our data. 
We also mentioned this idea of coercing. We just need to be aware of that. Um, it's going to come up from time to time. Be careful. And then we also went over the uh, logic of if and if then else in R. So that's really useful as well.